I am really pleased to, uh, to see such a crowd and thank you very much for coming. Um, I also just want to put my cards on the table. I'm a huge fan of public conversations and all the work that the Seniors Program does. So if you are not a fervent supporter of it, please become one <laughs> immediately. It's, um, it's a wonderful program both to be a faculty member that contributes to and also I think from everybody that I've talked to and all my students over the years to be part of in that capacity as well. So thank you very much to Julian and to Dr. Alan Aberbach who invited me to do this. So um, yeah, we're talking today about surveillance in particular. <coughs> and I'm going to, over the course of the hour, talk about a few different things. Um, why, why are we getting interested in surveillance? Where does it come from as a sociological phenomenon? Types of surveillance, and what I would say is a sort of a qualitative shift in recent uh, time about um, surveillance technologies and attitudes. The variety of opinions that are generally expressed about surveillance in our contemporary Western society anyway. I look at eight case studies, um, very briefly, not case studies in an academic sense, but just to illustrate some points, give you some further resources, and um, I hope leave you with some key questions. My intent today is to raise some questions and some ideas and principles, which I hope you carry with you. Um, where this comes from for me, it's true. Julian mentioned that my own interest has been in, around animating public space, and I have been working with the idea of public space as a resource for citizenship for a number of years now. Very interested in how we mark public space and for what kind of duration of time. I have a book coming out next year on monuments in Vancouver. Um, more recently, I've become really interested in shorter performances in public space. And then a few weeks ago, I actually did a uh, conference uh, with some other colleagues on the idea of witnessing. And again, this, this brought forward the idea of vision and visibility in public space and how these things work together. So making people and processes more visible makes them easier to regulate. We would all agree with that. That can be a good thing, OK? All technology is morally neutral but its potential users may not be. Let's take an example. Many, many people think that the way natural resources are actually regulated in the Scandinavian countries is a model for how we want to do things. Would you agree? You know, um, The Scandinavians, the Swedish, seem to know exactly how many trees are in that little part of the forest and where the water is and where this is and where that is and, and which field has to be done this way and that way. And it's allowed them to become really remarkable leaders in the field of, of sustainability. I asked a friend years ago why that was the case. How did they actually get there? And she said to me, she's a Swede, and she said to me, well, the border between Sweden and Norway was um, so frequently disputed that one of the former kings actually said, I want you to go out and inventory everything. I want to know everything at a very small scale. So that that gave people a database with which they could sort of say, this is exactly how we work the economy in this area and this area and this area. And so this you know, attempt to survey and, and, and closely monitor all kinds of um, small uh, resource out, outcrops and things allowed them later on to do good planning. So this would be a case where I think some notion of visibility and planning and uh, looking at things carefully has been helpful. Anyone know who these photographs come from? Edward <laughs> exactly, Edward Moodbridge. He um, and my hat goes off here to uh, Richard Smith, who's a colleague in communications at SFU. He said we have to think about visibility and observation in cinema very closely back to, to this sort of period where he was first doing his photographs, very close studies of motion. Some of you may remember the horses and the mules and even the elephants, and then men doing things like going up and down stairs or, in this case, being very athletic. You know, but this idea that we've, we've long employed um, means of, of recording and visual technologies to actually know more about uh, our lives. Some of you may remember this project. Anybody heard of the Mass Observation Project in Britain? 
Hands up, anybody heard of that? No, okay. Well, in uh, 1937, 2,000 volunteers were sought by the British government to do this incredibly detailed accounting of their daily lives, what they ate, where they went, sounds of the countryside, um, uh, transport systems, what they wore, conversations they had with members of their family. And it has created, as you can see on the, the right-hand side there, this massive amount of data, which is sociologically quite fascinating. It's been really, really interesting how you can recreate what farming was like, or you can recreate what kind of animals were present, because you can hear bird song that you can no longer hear, things like that. <coughs> Surveillance is slightly different, however. Surveillance comes from the French word for watching over. And as you can see in the definition, it often is attached to an idea of surreptitious viewing. The monitoring of behavior, activities, or other changing inf information, usually of people and often in a surreptitious manner. So why do we do that? Well, one of the clear applications is in prisons. This is the interior view of the cell house in the new Illinois State Penitentiary at Stateville. There you go. <laughs> but many prisons from uh, many centuries ago, right up to the present, Foucault wrote about this a lot, uh, you have this unseen central figure who is able to see, okay, the idea of the panopticon. So this is one person or a handful of people actually monitoring the behavior and activities of a whole ranges of people around him, okay? So that's, that's one time that we think of surveillance looking over um, as perhaps useful to maintaining social order. But I want you just in your own minds to think for just a moment about how many means of surveillance you can think of. And I'm going to give you a clue here. You might have thought of some of these. Video cameras, pretty ubiquitous now. Identification cards of all descriptions, passports, um, driver's licenses. The bugs, famed by James Bond and others, the martini olive type bug. Uh, spies, of course, I love this image of the spies. Um, slightly older version, but nevertheless, any of you who are members of Amnesty International know that actually postal interruption is a huge form of surveillance internationally still. And these unmanned drones, which can be used for aerial surveillance, um, benignly for weather, and not containing small boys from Colorado, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, obviously in war zones, not so benign. They can be unmanned drones for um, figuring out all kinds of information visually. So those are kinds of surveillance you may be used to. But there are other kinds now. We've kind of gone through, a, as I say, an exponential shift, which has to do with the electronic database world, actually massively changing um, what's possible to keep track of. So here we have cell phones. How many of you have a cell phone? Hands up, okay. We have computers. How many of you have a computer? Okay, even more of you. Um, anybody know what this thing is on the bottom with the eye? Optical scanner, yeah, the iris recognition thing, which is increasingly becoming a part of way of making it easier to go through border zones, okay? If you're part of a Nexus Pass, for example. Temperature scanning, which we don't have only in SARS-ridden places. We have them in the Kelowna airport, okay? So um, there's like a lot of other things going on now. And this thing in the top right-hand corner is actually a mapping of social networking. Um, those people that talk to each other about various things. It doesn't look like a geographic map, but it's mapping relationships. And of course, the global positioning satellites I don't know how many of you have a GPS or think it's, you, okay, good, or, or, or think it's really cool to have a little device. We gave something to a fellow in my office who was retiring that he was just thrilled about. And uh, it means that at any point we know exactly where he is. I don't know quite why that thrilled him, but uh, <laughs> he thought it was pretty cool. So, 
So there's these kinds of qualitative shifts in surveillance technologies. And um, it gets even a little bit more complicated than that. Now, those of you who buy things online, you may have heard of the phrase cookies. <laughs> They're not these kind of cookies, okay? These are things that if you buy something online or even if you sign a petition or whatever, these are ways for the computer to begin to recognize related sets of data and, and create a profile of you as preferences. Um, for, for, uh, you can get rid of cookies, theoretically, but um, you should just know that if you actually start to do things online in terms of your, your own personal business, these things can become embedded as part of that process. Loyalty cards. Uh, Air Canada, Aeroplan cards, Safeway cards, all of those sorts of things, again, create an electronic trail of you as a consumer, even if you go to hotels, okay? A lot of your information is actually on your hotel card. So when they say return them back in, good idea to do so, okay? Um, so there's some interesting things going on. <laughs> and we're becoming not so much the spy on spy world, but a world where everybody's able to look at each other. We're getting quite addicted to watching, hence the reality shows, and getting quite addicted to being watched as well, I would say. <coughs> and it gets a little bit more spooky. Um, there's also this stuff now called radio frequency identify identification tagging devices. Believe it or not, in that fingertip, there's a little tiny thing in there which can contain huge amounts of information and be um, read by certain kinds of radio wave processors. They're called RFIDs. We have the concept of data mining now, which is taking all of these electronic trails that I've just talked about and putting them together in a way that recognizes relationships that perhaps even you don't realize about your own preferences. That's where it gets pretty interesting. Um, they, they apply statistical and algorithmical um, previously unnoticed relationships is what they're trying to look for, okay? And also, in the past, there's been a concern that the government is the source of surveillance. But increasingly, we find much more surveillance is actually developing within the corporate world about consumer behavior and things like that, and about video cameras outside their spaces. So we have a different kind of surveillance environment happening. Now, what matters about this? As I started with, making people and processes more visible makes them easier to regulate. That can be a good thing. That can be helpful. That can be useful. The flip side, though, as Don Butler says in Ottawa Citizen, you might wake up one day and find that you're on the wrong side of some new definition of normal. And those of you who have lived through uh, periods in history, shall we say, where the new side of normal got shifted on you, I think are particularly well placed to, to notice this and be troubled by this because um, we have a situation now where data can be aggregated and people can actually determine patterns of individuals about not only their actions and their habits and their preferences, but also about their beliefs. That can be intuited from a variety of information. The frequency with which they attend to certain locations, their social connections, their preferences in other ways. Now, we live in a remarkably free society, and we're all beneficiaries of that. But you can imagine how this plays itself out in more totalitarian places. Um, there is no dictator in history, not Hitler, not Mao, not anyone you can think of, who's ever had access to this level of surveillance of its own citizens. <clears throat> so let's look at some examples. Computer and internet. Right now, all phone calls in the United States and broadband internet traffic which includes all your emails, webmails, instant messaging. They are required by federal law, post 9-11, to be available to federal law enforcement in real time. So not with a delay of three months or whatever. You, know, you, you, you find that right now, 
So if there is some sort of system which is figuring out every time you use the word, you know, SFU, somebody's going to send up a signal. Um, that is that is a capability that they have right now within the United States. There are programs called the Magic Lantern and other things which can be installed either on site or remotely, which can access personal computers remotely and access that information. There's also a system, um, lest you think Canada exempt from this, the Echelon system, intercepts and analyzes millions of emails, phone calls, faxes, and telexes right now in, as you can see, a number of English-speaking countries. <coughs> Facebook. How many of you have a Facebook account? Okay. Many people say, oh, I've got one to keep in touch with my grandkids or my ex-roommate or something else. Um, 140 million active members around the world. Okay, it's a huge phenomenon. It just completely exploded and Twitter is going even faster. One thing you need to know about Facebook is that in real time it may serve a really great social function, but the data may be stored indefinitely. You don't know. Um, it can be used by third parties. That's actually legal in many cases. And the question is, who, who's rules apply. Many people when queried, there's a program going on, I think it's at the University of Ottawa, um, who said when he's been interviewing students, they say, I only put things up there that I want my friends to see, which is fine. Hello. <laughs> but um, organizations may have a very different set of rules by which they're playing, which is that anything online is public information. And you may have read some cases uh, recently in the press that information from social networking sites has actually been used in some pretty fascinating ways. Um, a woman in, I'm going to say Quebec, I'm not sure it was central Canada, a few weeks ago was found smiling in a picture. So they threw her off social assistance because she was supposed to be depressed and she had actually gone on holiday to not be depressed and posted the picture and they took her off. Um, you know, that's sort of the people regularly say, even in university admissions and certainly in job uh, hiring forums, that they actually check for Facebook pages to see what kind of a person are we hiring here, okay? So if you have a niece or a nephew or yourself or your partner or somebody else, just be aware that these things don't necessarily get used in the way that they are first put, put on. In fact, it is... Uh, it has been traced to some criminal activity as well in, in the sense of figuring out frauds and things. But um, Another thing that's going on, again, that meshing of the databases. Anybody know what that car is on the bottom? Street View. Okay, so this is a Google car. It has a camera up top. I put this picture in because this is a Google car getting a ticket, which I think is pretty funny. <laughs> But um, this is a car that is going around at the street level, so not an aerial surveillance, but at the street level is taking the pictures at street level of, you know, lots and lots and lots of streets around the world, um, just as it did with Google Earth, and I don't know if any of you have tried to find where you live uh, aerially, but it, the idea is that soon, and I believe it's Nanaimo is, is aiming to be the first completely mapped city in the world or something on Google. Um, but you can combine that sort of thing with other things, and it gets a little more complicated, as we'll talk about in a minute. Also, increasingly, biometric data is getting mixed with video camera data, particularly at sporting events, to actually look for facial recognitions of known troublemakers. Okay? So you get scanning of crowds, and then they find particular people. Um, is this going away, or is this growing? I mean, the UK has uh, famously led the way on this. There are over four million closed circuit TV cameras in Britain, which is not a very big country physically. And um, they assume that um, an average person appears on a camera approximately 300 times a day. There's one camera for every 14 people in the UK. Now, some people said that's just really, really, really scary. But then other people said, well, we want to be like this, like the mayor of Chicago. By 2016, we're going to have a camera on every street corner. Okay? So the idea is you're fueling a kind of a logic that this is a good thing. 
<clears throat> There's also, as I mentioned before, these radio chips. They can be embedded in consumer goods and also animals. This is a paper wasp, okay? It has a little chip on it. That's actually a pretty big chip. But again, for inventory control, by 2019, so very, very soon, maybe, they're saying that actually RFID chips could replace universal product codes on every single thing with a unique identifier code. So every item on Earth could actually have this unique code. So we're back to thinking about Sweden and Norway and is this a good thing or a bad thing? Also, there is a strong feeling among surveillance scholars that this is actually going to accelerate and, and in fact, be part of the human experience as well. You can see in this x-ray, there's little chips right here. The process, they say, of doing this will start in the developing world, probably with criminals, okay? And then spread to stigmatized groups in the West, such as pedophiles and perhaps those on social assistance. Then after a while, the employers will start making implants a condition of employment because you can monitor all kinds of things. Chipped individuals will get discounts and other privileges. Eventually, having a chip will be essential for everything from voting and driving to shopping and medical care. And you can also almost imagine how the arguments might go. Well, it's much more secure. Like, if you have something embedded in yourself, it's much less likely someone can steal your identity. Okay, well, probably true. So we have a variety of opinions that we tend to hear. <coughs> I'll let you just read those for a second. If you aren't doing something wrong, you have nothing to fear. Many of us assume that to be true. Many of us are law-abiding <coughs> and aren't particularly rabble-rousing. The U.S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, admittedly in another age, said, actually, the right to be left alone is indeed the beginning of all freedoms. And the head of Sun Microsystems said, actually, it's over. The game's over. So don't really worry about it too much. <clears throat> in a certain sense, I would say there's some truth in all three of these. But there's an important caveat, which I think we do need to remember in Canada and uh, certainly in the United States. <clears throat> right now, the, the, the discourse is that the biggest threat to civil society in our continent is these leaderless, geographically dispersed groups of terrorists. So the argument has gone that in order to actually figure out what makes them, distinguishes them as terrorists that are able to coordinate things, we actually have to survey a whole other part of the population. So we have, if you will, a control group. Okay, And so you have this notion that you're a little bit caught in that crossfire, with, like that image of a few slides ago, where um, even though you may not be doing anything wrong, it's important that you create a body of attention and, and um, a mapping, if you will, of society so that peaceful citizens can be distinguished from terrorists. This leads uh, Valerie Steves at the University of Ottawa who's one of the many people working on surveillance in, in Canada, to say, have we got it backwards? She claims we've inverted the relationships between the citizen and the state. Our governments ought to be transparent to us so the citizens can hold it to account. Instead, it's the citizens who are being made transparent because we're all viewed as potential risks. So... Take a deep breath. It's not all bad news. <laughs> there is a guy at the University of Toronto called Steve Mann, and he said, well, you know, surveillance looking from above, let's actually invert that relationship. And he's coined the term surveillance. Excuse me, I, you probably can say it a little bit better than I, but um, looking from underneath, okay? The art of inverse surveillance, and as you can see, this has been taken up, he's at the University of Toronto, but this was taken up in Denmark. It's being taken up around the world as a very interesting experiment. And here, we get into our first high-tech part. Yes, well, recently we've deployed a project that we're calling IC. Uh, this is designed uh, to be an inverse surveillance system. Uh, that is to say, 
that it will help you avoid surveillance. Uh, it's part of a larger initiative we have of uh, turning, turning these systems of power and control on their heads and handing them off to people who can use them for, for whatever purpose, such as activists. Uh, and in, in this particular case, I see it's like it's like MapQuest for for anybody who wants to get uh, to to avoid sur being surveyed. So we have a map of Manhattan. We have all the locations of the surveillance cameras in Manhattan mapped out, and you can click where you are, where you want to go. And we have a little artificial intelligence algorithm that gives you the most fastest path that that avoids all of the cameras or as many as possible uh, to get you from point A to point B, and gives you a map. Uh, that you can print out uh, when all is said and done. Uh, we're, we're working on other cities. We're working with, we need to work with other groups in other cities because uh, that's the really hard part is mapping out the cameras. We didn't even do that ourselves. Uh, we, we work with a group called the New York Surveillance Camera Project and the Surveillance Camera Players. And uh, that takes actual people going out, being on the street, take a map, you know, look for the surveillance cameras. You have to know what they look like. That's really important. A lot of people don't know what surveillance cameras look like. Uh, people, you, you've probably seen the big elongated white boxes, and they're, they're really obvious, but most of the cameras today are these sort of half domes. Okay. And you'll find them at the top of, uh, of traffic lights oftentimes, or at the corners of buildings. And these are, these are there's a camera inside that you know, can rotate around, uh, but that's basically what, what most of them look like. So you see these things, mark them down on a map. If you can, tell which way they're pointed or if they're movable, that's really important. If you can tell if they're attached to a building, probably they're owned by the building. If they're attached to a telephone pole or a street light, probably owned by the city. Uh, and that's kind of important because that depends on you know who has access to the information. So marking these things down on maps and sending them to us or to the surveillance camera players or New York Surveillance Camera Project um, our website is appliedautonomy.com. Uh, email us IAA at appliedautonomy.com. Send us uh, this information. We can all start working together, set it up in Chicago, London, Seattle, you know, all these cities. There are versions of that. And the surveillance camera players, I have to say, I was going to put a clip in them too. You know, they are designed to be seen on surveillance cameras. So they're designing for very, very poor quality black and white film, which is mostly gray if you see the, the crime reportage and things. But they come out um, sort of in the, the early talkies mode. You know, they have a big placard and they say, my favorite one is, um, it's okay, officer, I'm only shopping. So they, you know, <laughs> they hold this thing up and then they hold up their shopping or it's okay, officer, I'm only going home from work. And, and, it's, and it's just nice, they sort of stage these plays for this anonymous person inside the panopticon, panopticon that you can't see. And so they're playing with the very idea of looking back at the thing, looking at them. Now, there's another issue. <clears throat> is surveillance always bad? And what is the relationship between witnessing and surveillance? Because again, if we go back to the beginning of the talk, I talked about the, the relationship of vision and visibility in public space. What's your assumption about surveillance and safety? Anybody have a guess? It's exaggerated that surveillance makes things more safe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they haven't, of course, been able to do the kinds of studies that would cover the kinds of numbers of cameras we've got, but pretty extensive studies have been done in a number of places, the UK among them, also a big one just out of California. They tend to reduce crimes of property, okay? They tend to reduce crimes of burglary or break and enter. They do not tend to appear to have much of an effect on violent crime. And those of us who live our lives in, in uh, go around public spaces would actually probably prefer that they had more of a deterrent effect there. They tend to move crime perhaps just outside, but not actually decrease it. We all know of cases where it's been very helpful, actually, and it's important that we do remember that that can happen. Um, there is something about the real-time nature of it. They can actually interrupt activity that's going on at the time. They can help occasionally identify um, perpetrators. <coughs> so that's I want to put that out there, that, that some of the argument around surveillance is helpful to democratic principles. <clears throat> also, surveillance doesn't always fuel a logic of suspicion. 
Occasionally, um, witnessing can do that. Witnessing, which we tend to think of as a good thing, um, can inadvertently be used in a different sort of social context and actually lead to effects that we're not quite as clear about. For example, um, in the beginning of 2009, you're probably aware that there was a, a massive aerial bombing of, of, um, by Israel. And the Al Jazeera network in the United States, the viewership went up 60%. Now, admittedly, from a very small original viewership, but people, for the first time, were seeing actions by the Israeli state around bombing, and they were quite shocked. And this, within the North American uh, market, fueled a kind of a conscience and an idea about should there be war crimes, blah, blah, blah. The same footage was used in Algeria, Al Jazeera stations in the Middle East, where they actually frequently document all kinds of problems, and it fueled a, a logic of war and actually increased um, a feeling that, that peacemaking uh, was impossible with such, you know. So, so you have to be careful about how witnessing and surveillance get thrown around. Also, as pointed out by the cookies and the computers and the cell phones and all the rest of it, to a certain extent, to be a participant, an active participant in society is to agree to be in a surveillance society. It is kind of a condition of how we live now. <clears throat> so, some key questions, and I'll return to these at the end, but I think at any point when you're thinking about a new technology that you might decide to pick up, think about who is affected, who is, exempt, who is exempted. Not just what it says on the box, you can do this, okay? <laughs> what are the rules of engagement? What are perhaps some unintended consequences? What logic is being fueled by any collected or conversely uncollected information? Let's look at some case studies. <clears throat> Disease monitoring. Now, whatever your feelings are about how the H1N1 situation has rolled itself out in Canada, um, there is a real positive effect of knowing about epidemiology, where and when health problems may occur. So we have here um, very specific timing. This is the 17th of August. H1N1 incidents, um, ideas about uh, ages, where the clusters are, suspected cases, deaths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So disease monitoring is one of the places where actually surveillance can be extremely helpful. It can, it can tell you where to deploy um, vaccines. It can tell you who's likely to be at risk. Um, it can tell you, you know, how, how you actually... Um, will best address those kinds of things. It can even sometimes tell you what the vector of disease is. Is it water? Is it touch? Is it bodily fluids? Is it poverty? You know, uh, these kinds of things can be really, really helpful. <coughs> the EU is fast following on the heels of Britain. It has actually said, well, we want to empower police to conduct remote searches. Do you remember that magic lantern idea? of personal computers. We want to make this legal that we can do this because we want to monitor again these leaderless dispersed crowds of people we don't know who they are. So they are proposing a database to contain information on every phone call, email, and internet visit. So that's like if you decide to find out what really happened to Britney Spears, you know, somebody knows, okay? As well as mandatory fingerprinting of all passport holders. Okay, so this idea of this mass kind of surveillance is actually being discussed right now by the European Union. The Olympics, a case close to our hearts. Um, these mega events are considered primary targets for terrorists, and therefore they're becoming also primary targets for intensifying and trying out new kinds of surveillance and security technologies. Um, other mega events that we see this around are World Trade Organization gatherings, the G8, the G20, the World Cup. You know, we see this happening in each of these, each of these cities that are, that are holding these kinds of events. So um, it, it is a little bit interesting to look back in time and see what the legacy has been. Well, in Athens, they had a huge increase of cameras, and guess what? Still in place, 2004. 
London, as we talked about, already has four million cameras, but they want to add another 50,000 just for the Olympics, okay? And they're saying, well, you know, we could disable them, but we'll leave the wiring, i.e. the wiring to a central location, okay? So again, this idea that, well, we could just, and you could see in that one video, you could see that the cameras, you wouldn't know if they were operating or not. It's very hard to know from beneath what's going on there, okay? Vancouver, some of you are probably following this debate very closely. Um, I keep trying to get a definitive number, and I keep seeing that it is being debated, but sometimes I hear it's going to be 300 cameras, and sometimes I hear it's going to be 10,000 cameras, and sometimes I hear it's just cameras that can read license plates, which I wonder why license plates, because I would think tourists, by and large, would not be driving around, but I, I don't know. Um, and they're saying, well, now we're going to have at least this many, but we're not going to tell you where they are. Um, and we'll likely keep them in storage afterwards for special events. Well, obviously, once you deploy them, it's much easier to keep them in place because what do you do? You take them down, and then you reset them up in advance of the fireworks. You know, And where do you think they're going to be? Do you think they're going to be around Stanley Park? Or do you think they're likely to be at Hastings in Maine? You know, um, so, so we have even in our own little area here, quite a close relationship. And this lovely man apparently invented this bicycle. Um, I'm very impressed by it, actually. <laughs> so in Vancouver, we actually have a nexus of some pretty interesting things. Some of you may have actually heard about, there was a show just uh, finished a couple weeks ago about surveillance, and there is a group of people here. Um, there is, in fact, the Vancouver statement around surveillance, security, and privacy. Um, I'll read this second part. As researchers from Canada and the wider world, we are conducting research on the global security dynamics of mega events. We agree that the Olympic Games should be a celebration of human achievement, friendship, and trust between people and nations. However, we've analyzed some past and planned Olympics, and from a historical and international perspective, we recognize that recent games have increasingly taken place in and contributed to a climate of fear heightened security and surveillance, and goes to lay out a number of principles, again, tracking this line so that we have the benefits of what surveillance can, can help with, but actually we put, in check, we put in place some things that can check it. <clears throat> Here's another case in China. Um, it's called the Golden Shield. Now, we know about um, the Chinese government already, again, a bit taking the page out of the uh, Norway-Sweden thing. China has done a remarkable job of lifting huge numbers of people out of poverty, and they've done that largely by knowing what the resources are they have to hand and massively planning society. They have also, as we all know, had a horrendous record on human rights. Um, so here we have IBM, General Electric, Honeywell, by the way, not known to be Chinese countries, co companies, and the Chinese government are installing millions of cameras, which are then linked to that facial recognition thing, and they are connected to a centralized database and monitoring system. Their goal is to contain the picture of the face of every person in China. I would ask you, why? I don't know how that is argued as something that needs to be done, unless for some, well, who, I, I literally don't know how that would be argued as necessary. <clears throat> On the flip side, uh, many of you probably know that Iran had an election on June 12th of this year, and it was widely reported to have been fraudulent in um, well, the votes were actually reported before they could possibly have been counted. That was one clue. But um, interestingly enough, Iran, from the revolution uh, two decades ago, has actually become one of the leaders around social networking. Who knew? Uh, people have been very, very good at the technical aspects of uh, internet, social networking, software, things like that. And this is actually a mapping of where people's conversational and affiliative groups were. Largely, what we know about the Iranian uh, elections and the continuing protests up till, I believe, the next event is tomorrow or Monday, 
has been gotten out through things like Twitter, cell phones, uh, Facebook, um, all kinds of other really interesting uses. The Iranian government tried to shut things down. Other people in the blogosphere internationally picked things up. These people, this talks about Egypt, secular reformist, Muslim, you know, all these different angles to get stories and images out. And so it's been a fascinating example. We used to say in the 60s, um, the revolution will not be televised, but it came really close in terms of Iran this summer. And, and so it's, it, in real time, things were happening. People were organizing um, according to, to uh, these kind of, they wouldn't, they wouldn't put any leaflets out or anything because stuff was being done at the last minute, but they could change uh, direction in terms of the public protest and things. Quite fascinating. South Africa. Again, South Africa is going to have a big sporting event next summer. Um, South Africa has a pretty big crime problem, not surprising given the legacy of apartheid. But when the Google car went to South Africa and showed people exactly street level views, the government came back and said, could you please stop doing that? Because this is just going to make it a whole lot easier for people's homes to be broken into. <laughs> so actually, Google has this arrangement with the South African government to kind of blur the perfection of those street level views. So here's a case where that line gets drawn back a little bit. Um, again, a little bit about witnessing and the rise of what I would call indie media. Um, this is from witness.org, which actually takes technology tools and puts it in the hands of people who are involved in situations around human rights abuses primarily. And I'll let them tell their own story here. Luckily, I had the camera with me. With that camera on, they started lowering their rifles. It's an incredibly brave individual who tells the story of what's happening in a place where no news crews ever get. When you see images of people tear gas in the streets being beaten, that means something on a human level. I did a tour for Amnesty. I traveled to different countries and met people who had been tortured, who had watched members of their family killed in front of them. And one of the things that amazed me was that these people could suffer like this and then have their stories buried. And it seemed that if they'd had cameras, there might be a better chance of doing something. And then the Rodney King incident happened in America. That video really catalyzed the international debate about police brutality and it put the handicam on the map. And at that point, it sort of clicked. And that was the beginning of Witness. The idea was, the more cameras that are out there, the more eyes that are out there, the more concerned perpetrators will be. A Witness partner is a human rights organization that wants to incorporate video into their work. Be it the right to be free from torture, or the right to health or to education. We accept applications from groups involved in the whole range of human rights issues. We would use research, we would use documentations, but we wanted something more to this. People at a grassroots level know what the problems are and they hold the keys to the solution. We're not trying to replace written reports or in-person meetings. We want to integrate video next to existing strategies so that they make effective, complementary tools for change. People are rarely in the right place at the wrong time to capture an abuse as it happens. And what we found is that it doesn't matter. It's not just the graphic imagery, it's powerful personal stories and context that really help move the work forward. <laughs> How do we make video for advocacy? What are the different steps that we have to think through? We work with them from start to finish, from conceptualizing the problem and the video message, and then scripting, shooting, editing, all the way through to the distribution of the video within a campaign. 
and we get more applications from groups than we can accept. Our response is also to provide short intensive training sessions for networks of activists with the long-term goal of creating self-sufficient video advocacy initiatives around the world. Providing ongoing access to this unique and important footage has become a key part of our work. They told me that the U.S. had a story they wanted from me, and it was their job to get it. Our strategy is to put images and words in front of people who can make a difference. Witness videos are used as a tool for grassroots mobilizing and organizing, as a means to promote public action through the media and the web, as evidence in courts and tribunals, and in targeted screenings for key decision makers. The ultimate goal for any campaign is change. That may be change in attitudes, or in behaviors, or beliefs, or in policy. Arrested. The House Ethics Committee is expected to launch an investigation. We've created a website where anybody, anywhere, can upload imagery of human rights violations. The Hub is the first video sharing site of its kind to focus specifically on human rights. These people are then plugged into a worldwide community of people who care. It's really a continuation of Witness's work, harnessing the power of video and digital technology to defend human rights. So this, for me, is very close to the fulfillment of a dream. And I'm very proud that the voices of the people from inside Burma have been heard. Do we have a responsibility? I think everybody has a responsibility. And the minute you start empathizing and imagining, then it's very hard to keep your mouth shut. Margaret Mead once said that you should never underestimate the power of a few committed individuals to make a difference. And a witness that underlies our central philosophy. You simply can't afford not to make a difference. We're here for too short a time not to care or not to get passionate about what matters most. Closer to home, there are surveillance technologies which may come to all of our homes fairly soon. Remember I talked about biometric uh, monitors. They are now things that happen um, to analyze walking gait and rhythm. And they, there is talk now of allowing people to live independently in their homes longer because someone who loves them can just sort of look at a biometric monitoring device, which, which figures out, are people thrashing in bed? What's their temperature? How often are they getting up to go to the restroom? Uh, do they open the door in the morning? Are their habits veering from their norm, or are they staying in their norm? Other kinds of things. These, the idea, again, is this might be programmed to actually allow people greater autonomy and greater liberty, or you can probably imagine the opposite as well. But, you know, the, again, the technology can be neutral. It's the potential uses that we want to worry about here. <clears throat> the good news, finally, is in Canada, there are a lot of very, very thoughtful and bright and committed people working on these issues, particularly. First of all, we have a privacy commissioner, Jennifer Stoddard. That's her webmail address. Um, we actually have, I'm sorry, the, it's covering here a little bit. Hi. We actually have a center for surveillance studies at Queen's University, which is considered one of the leaders in the world. David Meekin Wood is the principal, um, that we call them the CRC, um, the highly esteemed academic position. Um, right here in Vancouver, we have something called the Vancouver Public Space Network, and we have an, a, a joint project with SFU. Richard Smith is the lead guy for the surveillance project in uh, SFU. Andrew Pask for the VPSN. And again, some websites there. That Vancouver statement I mentioned earlier is, uh, is on that website. 
But we have other we have other centers of excellence around this at Toronto, University of Toronto, at the University of Victoria, at the University of Alberta, at the University of Ottawa, and the big one at Queens. So we have lots and lots of options, um, and pretty interesting stuff coming out in real time. Again, because Vancouver is so much a center of this kind of attention right now, precisely because of the Olympics. So, further resources in terms of witnessing the Red Cross Rest Crescent, uh, all you will know from many, many years, it does a pretty good job. You just saw the thing about witness.org, Amnesty International does its own version, and I stress not only outside the country, but actually within uh, Canada in terms of the uh, conditions of poverty and despair actually within Canada as well. <coughs> Key questions again. Who is affected by the technology and the information? Who is exempted? Who gets to watch? Who gets watched? What are the rules of engagement? How long does data last? What are any unintended consequences? What logic is being fueled by any collected or uncollected information? What kind of looking are you doing, and who's looking at you? Thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor to questions now. If people, uh, because we don't have a roving microphone, if you can just uh, speak up and ask your question when you're called upon in the back. I wonder where the cameras are invisible. How long and who Great questions. <laughs> Well, there's one. There's a red line on it. I don't know the answer to that. This one, well, how about for the, the um, seniors one? Yeah, no, not without uh, gripping irony. Yes, we are, uh, we are offering our own uh, uh, streaming video of the presentation uh, for the website. So yes, but I don't, I don't know of any other cameras. Uh, in but how long would it be kept? Uh, that will be kept hopefully indefinitely, because I think we can continue to learn from the topic. But I don't know. I mean, clearly this building has all kinds of cameras in it, and I, um, what, I, I did not do that research, so I don't know. Generally, people say we wipe them after three days or 72 hours or two weeks or every year. It seems it, when something gets in the news, things have been wiped right before it would have been useful to not do that. But, um, <laughs> but I honestly don't know. It's an excellent question. Yes? It seems to me that... Um, I, I think um, I think the rule setting needs to be made more transparent. Um, you know, even in my lifetime, when I when I teach my students, I occasionally say, "Imagine what the world would be like if you didn't have a cell phone," and they and they can't imagine it. They literally can't imagine it. And and you know, they don't. They, you know, there is no conception of a world without the kind of wiring and electronic and wireless, frankly, ways that we do things. So I think what's really important is to, is to make sure that we are aware of the principles by which we are deciding what we're doing, deciding who it's being done to, deciding how long information is stored and in what sort of place it's stored. 
Um, for example, the case of, of uh, Arar is really fascinating. You know, the Canadians finally cleared him, but the Americans still have not cleared him. It's really unclear to know what kind of evidence is being arg argued for there, and, and I don't think, frankly, we'll ever know. But, but this, this notion that you can collect information covertly and make decisions about it that literally are life and death decisions, and nobody knows what the rules are, I think that's a problem. I think um, being able to say, um, I just happen to have, you know, a, the, the tragic case of Jakinski here, you know, that guy happened to have a camera, he happened to know how to shoot a video, he happened to be there, I mean, the likelihood of that is almost infinitesimal. And I don't know if you know the story, but he gave it to the police as evidence and they kept it and didn't return it until he actually became much more public and vocal about needing to get it back. So, so, you know, it's not simply the tools, it's actually the rules of engagement, I think, that, that are key. Yeah. I was wondering in terms of, uh, say, if there was no surveillance, what kind of society would we have? Because I personally think the surveillance is, as a practice is a very boring thing. And the opposite of surveillance is a friendship, and people should challenge the fear which is created because I think the grandparents' children generation has lived with a lot of fear of communism, of, of uh, fear of all kinds of war and so on. And it seems like the, the, the grandchildren generation is much more open to have more friendship. And I think that's the issue. I, I, my question would be how do we challenge surveillance? And is it possible to challenge surveillance with friendship and openness to hear other points of view rather than getting trapped more and more into fear? Because we're already fearing of dying and not enjoying the, the freedom to live. Well, uh, okay, he was asking what is sort of a, a counter to surveillance. He said surveillance is quite boring and couldn't we base sort of cultural uh, relationships on friendship and, and, and an alternative. And he was saying, he, he saw a generational difference. He said that younger people right now seem to be much more able to do that. And older people have lived with a variety of fears, um, communism, uh, socialism, uh, you didn't say that, but I'm putting no. that, you know. <laughs> but, you know, very, various kinds of, of big specters of, of disaster. And um, I... Weirdly enough, I'm going to quote back to you a French theorist um, that I've been thinking about lately, a guy called Derrida, and, and he talks about how um, hospitality in the present precedes justice in the future. And I just think that's quite <coughs> poetic, almost, because in those occasions when I've actually had a moment of calmness and attention and respect for somebody that... I normally would not feel comfortable with, and it transmutes into something quite human. It's interesting, that person is then in my world and then I'm in their world, and it does create a possibility that's quite different for how we proceed. And I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, you know, power is real and brutal in many places in the world, but I think that's a very interesting concept um, as a way of working with something other than fear. Yes, in the back? Uh, do you see the possibility of a kind of nightmarish uh, big brother world in the future? Do you think it's possible? The question is, do I think it's possible that a, a big, big uh, brother world is possible? And. Uh, of course, I do. I, I think it's also possible that it would be really screwed up. Um, you know, I think it's, I'm not sure that it would work as seamlessly as Orwell imagined it. But um, technologically, I do believe it's possible. Humanly, I'm much less convinced. Yeah? I just have a question about smartphones. Uh, I know that it's really easy now to use a smartphone to track your position. And, and that's like very accurate now. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a really good question about smartphones, whether how long the data is, uh, lasts and if it's queryable, meaning other people can, can get at it. Uh, I personally don't know, and I, and I also, I think unless, I would, I would throw that one by Richard Smith and his gang with the surveillance project at SFU, if you really, because I think the rules change on almost an hourly basis. And, and they may change by jurisdiction geographically. So um, I, I think it's a really good question, but I don't know the answer. Yeah? I think in the, um, 1984, the cameras were in the TV. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, too, about, you, you, said, you said broadband. Mm -hmm. um, is there only broadband, or? Right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now. Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, right now. Yes. And I can't get up, can't pick them off. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah. Until they finish the conversation. Right. I mean, I can listen into it. <laughs> you know, is, that, is that wireless? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a walk around the phone. The question is sometimes um, <coughs> when this woman picks up her telephone, she can hear another conversation on it, and she can't actually use her own phone because of interference of this other person's call. Uh, we happen to live in the same building, and I think it may have something to do with our building. <laughs> but but uh, um, I think, yeah, that sort of yeah, that, that sort of interference does does happen. Um, there was something else I was going to say about. Um, I'm sorry, it's gone. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, the questioner is saying that it's been known. Uh, is it known that people can corrupt photographs digitally and to implicate people? Absolutely, that's happened. You know. I, I mean, I think that's what you have to realize is that whatever seems possible on the side of good is also possible in the other direction. And so, what you really have to be paying attention to is how do we know that. Okay, how do we know that? So you, uh, yeah. Can you comment on the sophistication of the, because we know how to, how to collect packs of data, right? So there's yards of it sitting in, in right. various places. But my understanding is that the sophistication of being able to be interactive and to actually do something with that data leaves a lot to be desired. For example, your case number eight monitors and so on are put into a person's home. The reason for that uh, in, in a number of research projects is to try to capture yeah. where somebody has a fall yeah. or where there's an emergency situation. It's fine to capture, but if you don't alert, if, if whoever is monitoring the thing, and if it's just human bodies watching it, they're going to get tired, they're going to get bored. Right. What kind of electronic programs are being built and how fast is that part yeah, well, that's. It. I mean, uh, that is more coming, coming possibly. You know, it's not. It's not actually um, widely available. But there are certain as as the demographic ages in many countries around the world. Um, there is a notion of how do we do this? Uh, how, how do we actually build homes or allow people to be able to stay in their homes longer, for for fiscal reasons as well as emotional and and uh, social reasons. Um, I think, I think you're pointing out a really important point. From the reading I've done, what's interesting about the advances in, in putting databases together is that it's actually being held in more of the private domain rather than the government domain. So the data mining that's going on is largely around consumer profiling for reasons of commerce or other things. So they're ahead of you know, the government on this, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I remember what I was going to say earlier. In academic circles, um, we're aware of software, for example, that is used so that the, the computer screen is actually looking back at the person working on the computer screen and linking up keystrokes and eye motion. So we know it exists, it's just not existing at a scale that would make Big Brother, you know, real today for in, in a large level. This man here? 
Okay, I think we understand where you're well, headed with this. My point is, is that we have legislation in this province that collects data about incidents and risk in our healthcare facilities, but we don't do anything with that data to identify bad actors in the system. Okay. Shall we let the uh, speaker uh, respond? <laughs> okay, I don't think there's a question there, but, but you have given us information. I do think it's important for me to mention um, we've been concentrating on vision and visuality, but obviously there are other forms of monitoring that do occur. Voice, um, temperature, you know, other, other ways that we do scan, and obviously facial recognition as well. Yes? Three more questions. Interesting. Yeah, she was commenting on the case in, in China where they're trying to work up to a, a, a kind of a snapshot of the culture of 1.3 billion and saying that if that exists in perpetuity, there's a lot of, uh, if I can put words in your mouth, there's a lot of um, possibilities for either suppressing um, information about, say, another earthquake, like the one that happened, you know, with the, the numbers of people that have died, if you just say those people didn't exist. Or conversely, saying 20 years from now, wait, I think I'm related to this person because I actually have a tremendous visual um, likeness. Is that a fair restatement of what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I appreciate the quote that you shared about how, um, basically, how you know why why have fear if you haven't done anything wrong? Because I think that's an argument you'll encounter often, and I also appreciate the other arguments that you posited the, uh, to be fearful of surveillance. Um, my question is, are you, are you able to comment or do you have any, um, have you read anything about how on an individual level being aware of surveillance can affect behavior? And so I know you talk about crime and the reduction of crime, but um, I would imagine, especially people 
um, that are maybe 30 and under um, are very aware of how their behavior is being tracked and how they want to put an image forth of themselves. And I fear, um, I fear people living in a way that they don't feel that they should be living because of being watched. Yeah, really, really interesting question. Um, she, she was asking about, have I read it, do I know anything about um, how this atmosphere, if I can say it that way, of surveillance causes people to actually self-survey in a different sort of way or, or change the way they present themselves in the world. Um, I've heard it referred to as impression management, which I think is a really great phrase. Um, this idea that if you're living online, obviously you have a lot of control about how you put yourself across. Um, but equally, I think, what you're, I think what you're asking is also the, the psychological end of that. And I think there are huge implications here because people um, who do not feel they are ever having a private life or an ability to, to uh, an opinion that isn't somehow watched or whatever, or a behavior that isn't, will tend to move to the, the flatter and less risk-taking and less uh, questioning um, ways of, of being in the world. It's very difficult when, you know, we, we normally kind of operate according to what worked best last time, unless something really disruptive happens. But if you know that actually you're also being um, exposed somehow, it's very difficult to take a more um, experimental approach to that. And so there is a lot of concern that within workplaces where people are so monitored, you know, this idea that we know exactly what you're doing, we know where you are, we know how long you take in the restroom, we know when you have your breaks. I mean, is that going to make you likely or less likely to actually engage in a conversation which is outside the bounds of what is neutral and safe and already decided upon? So I think that's a great question. I'm going to put it in your hands, Julie. There's okay. too many questions here. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, again, that's probably the best comment to end on. I mean, I, I, think, I think it is through our own comments, and frankly, those of you who have lived through different periods and in different places where you've been um, exposed to more draconian regimes, I think it's really important that you lend your voices to a rehaul and a public discussion, and I, I much applaud um, Simon Fraser University and this program for actually bringing this forward. I think we're going to see more of this and we're going to hear more of it. And you should realize, you know, um, you're, on a, you're in a cutting edge city on this. You know, so you're, you're participants um, in this and your voices really matter to this debate. So if you can possibly use your computers to go click on to the surveillance project at SFU, you will get a lot of data there, which I think will allow these kinds of conversations to happen and these sort of lines to become clearer and perhaps to be renegotiated in some cases. So thank you. Thank you.